This segment of our course on electric motors deals with the cleaning, inspection, and repair or replacement of parts. We will also spend a few moments giving you some basic tips on troubleshooting common problems in motors. First, clean all parts thoroughly. Each plant will have a recommended procedure for completing this task. Steam, as shown here, is often used on most of the parts except the rotor and stator. The rotor and stator are usually cleaned very thoroughly with a solvent, such as Varsol, as being shown here. Your plant will recommend the cleaning method preferred for these critical parts of the motor. Another method used in cleaning the rotor and stator is compressed air. Sometimes it is just used to dry the parts after they've been cleaned with a solvent. Be very careful to use the correct amount of air pressure, since too much pressure could damage the windings. Once the stator has been cleaned, it is usually baked in a special oven for several hours to remove any remaining moisture. Be very careful that the temperature used is correct. If the temperature is set too high, it could damage the windings of the stator. It's best to check with your instructor or supervisor to find out the recommended temperature of the oven and approximate time for baking. Once the stator is completely dry, remove it from the oven and allow time for it to cool. The next step is to spray the stator windings with a special sealant or varnish to insulate them. Again, your instructor can fill you in on the requirements in this area. Once you've done that, remove the cover from the junction box. This is done to facilitate checking of the windings on the stator during the testing period. If it is necessary to have the stator rewound, arrange to have it done at this time. Most plants will have rewinding done by experts in that field. Your next step will be to check the rotating assembly for straight. This may be done by mounting the rotor between centers in a lathe and checking it with a dial indicator. The degree of runout, which is acceptable, should be stipulated in the manufacturer's manual. Now polish all journals on the shaft very carefully. Be sure you do not remove enough material from the shaft to change any of the tolerances. It should only be polished enough to remove residue and to expose possible damage. After this has been done, remove the rotor from the lathe and mount it in a dynamic balancing machine. Balance the rotor very carefully, ensuring that any remaining unbalance is within manufacturer's specifications. There are a number of different alternatives open to you if the shaft is damaged. Your decision will be guided by the policies at your plant. One solution would simply be to remove the old shaft from the rotor and replace it with a new one. However, the policy at some plants is to replace both the rotor and the shaft if either is damaged. Of course, this will depend on the size of the rotor and the cost involved. In some cases, it may be possible to repair the damaged area of the shaft by metallizing it and then grinding it down to the size specified by the manufacturer. If a section of the shaft is beyond repair, it is even conceivable that you might cut the damaged section off and replace it with a new section which could be welded in place. It would then be machined and ground to specifications. In short, there are a number of ways in which a damaged shaft may be repaired or replaced. Your instructor will fill you in on the practices at your plant. You can now check the bearings very carefully for wear or damage. Ball bearings are nearly always replaced when a motor is disassembled for repair or rewinding of the stator. This is usually recommended by the manufacturer of the motor. When changing bearings, be sure to check the identification of the replacement bearings against the manufacturer's specifications. The shaft bearing fits should be measured with a micrometer to ensure the proper interference fit. If there is any doubt on what the bearing fits should be, consult your supervisor or the manufacturer's manual. 
The bearing fit in the bearing cartridge should also be carefully miked. Although this is usually a clearance fit, it is best to check the manufacturer's specifications to be sure. Another important measurement is of the ID of the bushings in the bearing cartridges. Compare those figures to the OD of the shaft journal to ensure proper clearance. Remember that the bushing should not come in contact with the shaft unless the ball bearings fail in this particular motor. Measure the outside diameter of the bearing cartridges and compare the figures to the ID of the cartridge fits in the end bells. Again, there should be a clearance fit for this particular motor. The fan is usually very difficult to repair. This means that excessive wear or damage can best be remedied by installing a new fan. Inspection is the key word. Although the repair of wear or damage is very important, the elimination of the cause behind the problem is even more important. In short, find out what caused the problem and do something about it. There is a troubleshooting chart in your workbook which will help you recognize causes behind common problems you'll encounter in electric motor repair. Let's examine a few of them. One of the most important causes of damage or excessive wear in electric motors is poor maintenance. These motors must be properly maintained at all times if you expect the most from them. Dust, as shown on this motor, is probably the primary cause of most damage. Dust is fine, pulverized sand. It insulates the motor, raising the heat level. It plugs ventilation spaces and acts like sandpaper on bearings and other parts. Dust also unites with water or oil to form a gummy substance like this dirty rust-colored film. Stray oil can also cause a problem like this. Not lubricating oil, stray oil. Lubricating oil is the lifeblood of electric motors as long as it is in the bearings. But it can be poison outside. Sticky oil catches dust, deteriorates insulation, and shorts out connections. Moisture will accomplish the same things that oil will. It will collect harmful compounds and soak and soften insulation. If possible, enclose your motor to protect it from moisture and other harmful agents, like this one is. Friction is also a very powerful enemy of electric motors. Friction is usually caused by improper lubrication, whether it be insufficient oil or the wrong type. If in doubt as to the type of lubrication to be used, consult the manufacturer's manual. Another major problem area is misalignment. It can result in broken shafts, burned out bearings, overload failure, and other problems. There are many reasons for misalignment between a motor and the driven equipment. Check every possibility, including the foundations to which the motor and its driven equipment are secured. Vibration can be a direct result of misalignment, and a very disastrous one. Vibration can shake motor parts loose, crystallize metals, and multiply wear many times over. Always be very careful during your repair and reassembly to ensure that all parts are well aligned and tight. Those are just a few of the causes of electric motor failure. When you are taking a motor apart, watch for the possible problem areas and see if you can diagnose the cause. There could be a time that your diagnosis of the problem could prevent that motor from returning to the shop sooner than it should. Don't just fix the result. Find out the cause and fix it too. We have some questions for you now on the repair and troubleshooting of electric motors. You'll find them in exercise number three in your workbook.